All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Day One Founder Stories. I can finally say that because we've got a, a series here rolling. I'm Andrew. I'm the founder and CEO of Day One. And I'm here with Roman Malik, the CEO, founder of Rhetoric. Um, Roman, thanks so much for being with us. Really appreciate you taking some time. Of course. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So as we do, we're here to kind of unpack early stage founder stories because so much of what gets talked about and bantied about is the stripes and the big companies that are like, you know, it's not even relevant to the vast majority of founders who are just like in the thick of it. You're just in the, the, the grind. And so what we want to hear is sort of like, what is, what's it been like and what's the real kind of on the ground and everyone's unique story. I know yours is um, really exceptional of how you've gotten into things and you've been pivoting and, and learning. And so I'm excited for folks to hear about not just what you're building, but really how. But let's start off with a little bit of what, like, do you mind sort of introducing yourself and sort of what rhetoric is and what you're building? And then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. Definitely, definitely. And I was part of the second cohort of day one. We were just talking, there's, there's five happening. Experience. So, <laughs> so yeah. it's, uh, we're losing track of it, but yeah, OG, uh, second cohort was early days, OG. which was really fun. <laughs> yeah. And so when I started, I built rhetoric. And so rhetoric's a platform to facilitate feedback on presentations. And we provide feedback on first your spoken communication. So we use speech recognition algorithms using your microphone data. And we give you feedback on how you are presenting, how fast are you talking? How clear are you talking? What do filler words look like? And we combine that with feedback from mentors, peers, advisors, experts on the content and narrative of your presentation. So we're merging both the AI and the human feedback into one platform. I love that. And we're actually zooming on a very specific audience to kick things off, and that's founders working on their startup pitch. And so I think we both, both deeply know yeah. that <laughs> early startup success really hinges on that ability to articulate a vision and get others excited about it. Yep. And, you know, it's just so much harder than we think. It's like, okay, I have this idea. Oh like, cool, tell me about it. And suddenly my tongue is tied and I don't know what I'm saying. Oh and gosh. so we think with rhetoric, we can really help founders up level their pitches into something just really succinct and really powerful. That's gonna be so needed. Yeah, you know, that's one of the pillars of what we do here at day one. And we know we just sort of like scratch the surface of, hey, pitch, pitch all the time, pitch often. It's, yep. uh, it's a journey, it's a learning curve. Um, yeah, we see it all the time. So. Tell me a little bit about you and your story. So where were you coming from before building rhetoric? Um, what was sort of the, the through line that said, you know, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and now sort of like what led you to this moment from a career and sort of journey perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's been years in the making, I think. I went to consulting right out of school. So working on other people's products and only for a short amount of time. Did that for two years, picked up a good technical skill set. It was data science consulting. Um, and after about two years, I knew that, all right, I want to go work on a product I can really get my hands on, be part of, be deeply embedded in a team. And so I moved to San Francisco and joined Lyft. That Lyft for almost four and a half, five years, specifically on the growth team. So originally started, how do we think about driver acquisition? How do we think about market balance? Learned crazy amount about marketplaces, how to think about growth initiatives, how to spend, maybe waste a lot of money. There's a lot of learnings throughout that entire process. Eventually moved to the passenger and more product side of things, launched Lyft Lux, the luxury ride platform, and then spent about a year and a half almost experimenting with how to think about Lyft as a subscription business. So that culminated in Lyft Pink, which is this amazing subscription where it basically glues together all of Lyft's different transportation modes into one offer. And I, was, I know, and I know like you got to, to Kellogg, right? Or, or yeah. grad school. So how did the grad school experience sort of like help you pave the, the transition? Grad school is interesting. So I'm actually doing both of trying to build a company while in grad school. So I left Lyft in July of 2020, um, moved to Chicago and started this interesting dual degree program at Northwestern. So it's a MBA from Kellogg and then a master's from the School of Engineering that focuses in design. And my thought here was that, all right, hopefully this will round me out, but really it gives me two years to take my own time, identify what I want to work on as an entrepreneur, 
as a founder and just dig into those as much as possible. And the cool part is that you can be very tactical about it. You know, So early on, I knew that I had to go understand VC math. So I went and took a few finance classes. And very early on, I realized that I am not comfortable when it comes to selling myself or my products. And so I went and took a bunch of you know, entrepreneurial sales classes. Now I'm actually like TAing those classes to just keep reinforcing this skill set. So it's been nice to have this outlet of, all right, this is what I need to work on. Let me go work on it. But my main focus is building product. So, so you went to, to Northwestern to round yourself out in a really, uh, in a, and I know the program you're coming from, we've actually had a lot of day one fellows yeah. through that program. Um, it's really cool because it's both sides of the brain, right? It's design and business um, together. What led you to like launch your own thing? Was that always the plan? And it just sort of coalesced um, once you gave yourself this space or even if it was that sort of like, what were some of the like internal you know, nuances of you going yeah. from maybe I want to build, I'm going to build to like, I am building and this is it. You know, so as I went from consulting of working on other people's to Lyft on working on this kind of growing company's product, I definitely was like, all right, I need to keep going more like deeper and deeper. And I want to work on my own thing. And that became clear, I think a few years into Lyft. Um, I'd moved into management, which I loved. Um, I love working with young, amazing data scientists, but I was missing that just scrappy building something from zero to one testing and just having that, is this gonna work feeling? And that's when I kind of knew, all right, now it's time for the next step. What's the right way to do this? And I actually knew that I wanted to do something in that feedback space, which is, you know, when I came to school, it was like, all right, I know the space I wanna play in, I just don't know what I wanna build yet. So now it's a great time to just start experimenting with a hundred different products. So you were experimenting. So, 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 so you had the journey and I think a lot of founders have this there, there, there are many types of founders, but that is one where I'm going to build. I, I've felt the feels I've seen the forest for the trees and I'm moving there yeah. now. And you even narrowed yourself, which is really good. That's exceptional, right? If anyone's listening, if you can pick a lane, cause it's so hard, you hit analysis paralysis when you, when your aperture right. is too wide. So just you said, start, feed, right? yeah, just to start, just to even kind of feel you're not just spinning, going to, to, into too many things. Right. Um, what was it like to sort of find the, uh, and so talk, talk a little bit through the journey, because I know rhetoric was a thing, now it's a different thing. So tell me a little bit about how you went through that ideation, whether it was many things down to a few things into the, the iterations. Um, and, and I'm still going to ask you the question about like, when did you know, like, where was conviction? Because because like, did, did, was, it, was it baked in already and you're like, I'm gonna do this hell or high water or did you find it sort of, oh my gosh, this idea is really working. Um, so how was it? And then like, when did conviction come, come for you? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, so when I was at Lyft, I'd moved into management and you know, I'm working with some of the smartest engineers, data scientists, these computer science and math geniuses. And something I realized as Lyft kept growing bigger and bigger was that you could have built the greatest model or put together the greatest analysis on the planet, but that wasn't enough. You had to be able to go out and sell it. You'd go out and take what you built and say, this is why it matters and here's what we need to do with it. And I was never the most technical data scientist. I never will be, but my strength was putting to story and merging that with data and influencing a decision. And so when I moved into management, that's where I started working with my team around, all right, you built something amazing. We both agree it's powerful. Let's go sell this. And that's, I think, where this conviction started of there's an opportunity here to help more people do this. And that's what I loved about management. I actually got so much more satisfaction out of that kind of mentoring and management than putting together the next analysis for Lyft. So that's where it's like, all right, I'm deeply, deeply passionate about this idea. I think there's an opportunity that we all can benefit from. So now let me start playing around with it. That has been the roller coaster ride of what it looks like and is this working at all? I think one of the interesting things is, you know, I'm, I'm playing around with human motivation to a certain extent, right? Where I've built, but I think we've talked about this a couple of times, but I've built spinach. And I've said, here's spinach and I want you to eat it and it's gonna make you feel better and it's gonna make you strong. And you're like, awesome, I'd love some spinach. 
I'm like, great, here it is. And you're like, I don't really want to eat it right now, but maybe tomorrow. I'm like, okay, that's not good. And so as I have explored different pivots, it's been less about what we need to build, right? We know what kind of speech recommendations and speech coaching we need to do. It's really the medium and interface by which we give that such that people actually listen and actually get engaged with the product. And that's, I think, where we're still figuring out conviction of this is the right product, but we do have conviction on the space of this is the right problem to go after. We're still trying to find the right iteration of it. I love it. And, and, and there's a flow. You had sort of personal founder conviction. And of course, like you, this is what happens. I see this all the time. Like an entrepreneur has that moment, but sometimes it doesn't really link up with the space. They get conviction and they choose the wrong space. And I'm like, that's a bad fit. You're, you're not a yeah. fit. You need to loosen some of your conviction. You either need to pick a new space or like maybe not be a founder, but you had the founder conviction. You allowed that linkage to the space. Then, then the space became clear. Like you validated the problem, the, the need. And now I think you're doing, you, there's something really, really worth sharing in that mindset that you have, which is um, holding loosely the next piece, right? Yeah. And it could be this or it could be that. And you've done that so well. You've, you've gone forward. I remember Slack and just be like, get it out there. You just need to know yeah. and just like ship it, ship it, ship it. And you did. And that takes like, oh, man, the gearing up to ship something requires so much like belief and like fear conquering exactly. and then and then to pivot that's real right i feel like a lot of folks either don't ship or they ship and like hold so tightly to that like raft that they can't go to the next thing right so exactly. what was that like that's a question i don't get to ask everybody about like this it's early hard. stage pivot what was the feeling <laughs> almost around putting your first hypothesis aside and trying something new you know it's a completely different type of effort and motivation and work to do something like this because you have this idea, you want it to work, but you have to stay fluid. And that's something I think I've struggled with and, and get slowly getting better at. And the hard part about it is that you need small wins to keep the momentum up and to keep going. Because as an entrepreneur, it's so easy to get flustered. As you know, you can be optimistic, but a realist, and it's easy to say, this is just not working. But you have to be able to say, all right, that's fine let me keep going to the next raft and the next floaty and just keep doggy paddling my way through this. And that's been the hard part. And it's really what I've found is just finding the smallest wins, the smallest wins. It could be one thing one person said while using the product or something someone said in passing that, you know, you sprint over to a post-it note and write down. And it's really just taking that appreciation of, all right, I'm now one step closer to at least knowing what direction I should be going in and really nice. celebrating that. That's so real. That's so real. Um, and that perseverance, that doggy paddle, it's not efficient. It doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere fast, but staying in the game is at least half the battle in these early days, right? Yeah, um, there's nothing pretty about my swimming form <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, that's so real. Uh, but if you can get there, and of course it helps to be a little more efficient each time, and that's where you can be a better yeah. founder. You can learn, you can uh, that was, that was, I wasn't really thoughtful in that experiment. I wasn't really yeah. um, listening to my customer when I tried that. How do you be a little better each time, but you're still just trying that next time. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so fast forward a little bit what, or, or maybe actually step back half a step to see the journey. Now um, you're still in the thick of it, still working on the what's um, feeling more and more conviction, but, you know, always tackling that next big hypothesis or, or assumption. But in that whole journey, what are some of the things you've learned? You've already talked about a few of them, um, or at least just articulated some of uh, the kind of impressions that you've left with. But when it comes to the, the, the flow of it, what have you sort of learned? What have you thought it was this, but it's really that? Or, or just yeah. kind of like, man, this is what I need to tell the next founder who's coming up behind me um, about this journey. What, what's been hard? What are some of the challenges you've overcome? And what are some of the learnings that you've, uh, you've gleaned along the way? Yep. I'd say the first one is just that the technology is there and that's a big win, right? So we're using some really cool NLP speech recognition algorithms to take your microphone data, analyze it, and then build recommendations off that. And the cool part is that it's not perfect. We're probably seeing 80% accuracy in what a speech to text algorithm can translate, but that's good because it means that we're early and we're really on the cusp of, riding this incredible wave of what this technology can do. 
So that's great. And that was the first big question we had of, is this even doable? And so, all right, check mark, it's doable. The second takeaway is how do you influence and coach people? And so I think a lot about Fitbit, where Fitbit basically slapped a step number on a watch and said, look how cool this is. And I went and said, wow, this is actually kind of cool. But they didn't change behavior. And so I think that's where we're learning a lot every day around data is interesting. And people love personal data about themselves, around how they can improve, right? I can tell you I'm speaking at 143 words per minute, and I've said like six times. Like, that's cool. I like that I can see that and know that, but what does it mean next? And so the biggest takeaway is how do we actually shape these recommendations into actionable next steps for users? And that's where we're really seeing the most momentum around, all right, once we tell someone to do something differently, they actually do it. And that's really cool. Yeah. I feel like there's a, there's a real principle because I've played around with different projects. I was a consultant, so I did this a lot behavior change. And I start to say, don't try to change people's behavior. Um, but all apps services are trying to change behavior in one way or another. Maybe you're trying to do something for them, but you're hitting on something. It's, it's all about that feedback loop. It's about giving them not just data. Data doesn't create a feedback loop. Data creates something up here, right? But if they do something and they see the outcome, then they can see the, the feedback and be like, okay, I want more of that. Right. And whatever got them off the couch the first time will happen again. And so yeah, you need to show them some kind of outcome for them to, to reinvest um, in some sort exactly. of action. So, and you're That's biting off our thing. makes it from a tool to a coach. Yeah, and you're biting off coaching. Coaching is one of these tough, tough services to sell, right? Because people need to be motivated, but the way right. you're adding in tech and then the actual kind of platform or the process or the data um, is, uh, is probably, I mean, you're working on it, right? It's not a solved problem just yet, but it's, uh, it's definitely in the right direction. So, Here's, here's one way I like to round out these, these conversations, which is, um, again, to show sort of people where you are in the middle of the journey, as well as if somebody's listening to this and they're like, huh, this is really cool. I want to learn about how NLP can impact my presentations or that's a really cool problem. So like, what are you working on like right now? Like what's like, like the state of the, the next thing you're, you're, you're biting off and the challenge? Is it a hire? Is it a specific customer challenge, like where, where are you next? And if someone was like, I wanna jump in, they would kind of know where to, what to ping you about. Yeah, it's a couple of things. So first hiring, we are looking for a lead engineer. Um, so open to all conversations if you're interested in NLP, speech, coaching, self-improvement, all that fun stuff. Um, what we're right now building is we're product specking the platform side of this. So how do we merge that AI feedback with human mentorship on the content and the narrative. And so this is a really big design challenge around how do we actually build something that will scale really well, be intuitive and really reduce the friction enough. And so we'd love to talk to designers, love to show you some of the demos we've built out and just keep collecting feedback. And then when we think about where we're gonna scale this first, it's two founders and two startup communities. So if you're either of those two people and think this product could help you with your pitch or you know, your presentation or your founder network, reach out to me. Would love to, again, demo and get your thoughts on it as we keep building. Love that, love that. And you're definitely getting the, the day one boost when you're uh, ready to show folks. It's gonna be a really powerful tool and we're gonna be one of your alpha customers as soon as possible. So I love it. Um, this is amazing. Raman, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, thanks everyone for listening. This was uh, Raman's founder story, Building Rhetoric and uh, it's exciting times. Early stage founders are doing some really cool stuff. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Awesome, take care.